You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. All right, grab a Bible, open it up to James chapter 2, if you could. James 2, 14, James 2, 14. A little bit of silliness, but I want to pray. I was informed just before I got up here that there is a young autistic boy who is lost in Skyline Ranch. And so we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord to help those out there looking for him to find him. If you would just bow your head with me, extend your hand. Father God, we don't know the person, but you do. We don't know the situation, but you know it intimately. And so, God, we ask in faith right now that you will lead the searchers to that young boy that he will be unharmed, that he will be reunited with his family, and in Jesus' name, would your glory shine through in that situation. We believe it, and we ask it, and we thank you in advance. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Okay, so James 2, this is it. This is the last of James. It's been a fun series. We've bounced around. And as I got to 2, a a similar thing happened as, as it has with the rest of this chap with this book, is James 2 is a very, very famous passage. It's got the whole section that says, oh, you believe there's a God, good for you. Even the demons believe there's a God, and they're horrified, right? Um, it's got the whole talk about faith. And so if you look for, for sermons on James 2, you will find hundreds, hundreds if not thousands out there through different websites. You can listen to tons of sermons on James 2. And as I began to do that, as I began to research, as I began to read commentary, just nothing was sticking. Nothing was what God was saying. This was our message for this morning. And then I read James 2, 14 through 17, what I want to read to you here this morning. And God took me in a different direction. He said, I want to show you what I mean by those works. So let's see what it says here. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, But do not have works. Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, it is dead. Now I've spoken on this. I've actually spoken on this fairly recently on the importance of these words and gone into the background of it, but I don't, I don't want to focus on the theological side of it so much as I want to focus on that statement, faith without works is dead. See, last week, we spoke on wisdom, chapter one. We spoke where James says, look, you want wisdom, God gives it ungrudgingly. He, he pours it out upon you if you want it, but don't be double-minded. Don't ask for wisdom and then say, I'm probably not going to get it. Don't ask for wisdom and then say, better people than me deserve wisdom. God's probably withholding from me. He says, no, if you ask for it, have faith that it will come. Amen? So we're taking step two now of this journey. This is what's so cool. God put this together. God is so, well, he's God. Um, James 2. When we get into this understanding of faith without works, what I want you to see here is What do we do when we end up in those occasions and those temptations that actually overtake us? Let's say wisdom didn't pan out. Let's say we ignored the wisdom of God. Let's walk into this situation where some of you last week, uh, as we talked about wisdom, said, hey, I'm about four weeks too late for this. I've already made the mistake. I already messed up. And here's what's beautiful, is Christian or not in this room today, every single one of us has given in temptation, has has messed up, has chosen our own needs and pleasures over somebody else, has hurt other people to get what we want. Nobody is immune to it. It's just part of life. So what I want to take you to and where I'm going to go this morning is this word repentance, repentance. And if you're a Christian Maybe the first thing that came to your mind when I said that was, oh, good, we're talking about something I already know about today. Perfect. I've got repentance handled, right? As Christians, that's what it's all about. We get it. We repent. We say we're sorry. We try not to do bad things. We ask God to forgive us because we're just so awful and he's so mighty, and we trudge along through this life. False. 
I want to talk about true repentance versus proportional repentance. And I want to show you what that looks like. So if you want to switch to the Old Testament and turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. And I'm telling you this morning, I'm telling you this morning, whether you're a father in this room or a mother or a man or a woman or a child, a grandparent, This message on understanding what it means to repent will change your life if you understand what it means to repent. It will change the course of your life. It's wonderful to get wisdom, and if we all could get wisdom constantly, we wouldn't need to actually study today's sermon. But here's the thing, we don't. And even though wisdom is being poured out for us and it shouts in the street, we ignore it. But God has given us a path, and I alluded to this at the end of the sermon last week. He has given us a path out. He has shown us that there is a way out of the trouble, the calamity, the trials that we have gotten ourselves into. And it's through something called repentance. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, would you blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgression and my sins, they're ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart, in my inner heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Lord, hide your face from my sins and wipe away my iniquities. Would you create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me? Let's pray. Father, as we study these words of David, as we study the repentance of David, would you open up to the hearts and minds of those listening, including myself this morning, Lord, what it means, how much you love us, how terrible the price of sin is. And would we come to see it as you see it? In Jesus' name, amen. So if your Bible, I don't know if your Bible does this, most Bibles will give a heading a lot of times over certain verses. And if you look at the heading over Psalm 51, mine says, prayer for cleansing and pardon, a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone and slept with Bathsheba. It's pretty clear what's going on. So I want to give you the background and the story on this quickly. Rather than read through it out of 2 Samuel, I'm going to summarize it so we can catch up here, and then we're going to see what repentance is. And, and at the end of the service, we're going to take a moment, and, and we're going to offer a time to be able to get as clean and be able to speak like David did. So just know that. I don't want to surprise you with that at the end. That time's coming, and I can tell you it's worth every second you would choose to spend in the middle of it, okay? All right, so the story is this. There's, when David was in the wilderness running from Saul, remember this? Saul was king. Uh, He hears that through the prophet Samuel, David is going to be the next king. He decides to try to kill him. David's hiding in the wilderness. With him are 37 men who have sworn to him to protect him. I don't know if you knew this part about the story of David and Bathsheba, but Uriah was one of those 37. Uriah put his life on the line for David. Uriah loved David. He saved David. David is alive and king now because of Uriah and the 37. And when Samuel opens up with this story, right? When Samuel opens up, I believe it's verse 11, 2 Samuel 11. It says, at a time when kings were at war, David was at home lounging on his roof. At a time when he should have been out defending his city, defending truth, 
he was instead stayed home and sent his army. And isn't that so often when you and I get in trouble? We don't often get in trouble. We don't often fall in temptation when we're busy, when our hands have much to do, when we've got a lot going on. No, we often get in trouble when we're not where we're actually supposed to be. Right? And this is David. And so as he's there on his roof, he looks out, and there is the beautiful Bathsheba bathing on her roof. And so he says to his servants, bring her to me. Uh, They do what grown adults do. She gets pregnant. And Uriah is at war. So this is bad because she's going to give birth to a child from a time that everyone's going to know Uriah is at war. So he calls Uriah in from the battlefield, eats with him, drinks with him, and then says, Uriah, you're such a wonderful friend of me. Go home, be with your wife, um, enjoy a night at home, and then we'll go back out to war. He even gets him drunk, hoping, you know, that'll... That'll do it. Uriah goes home and goes to sleep on the grass in his front yard or the dirt in his front yard and says, how could I go and do that when my men are not able to do that? I cannot and I won't. See how much integrity this guy has? He's just an incredible, incredible, just not only man of God, but friend to David. And so David, like any good friend, is going to have him killed. Right? So he sends him back out, and he goes to Joab, and he says, listen, put Uriah where the fighting is the most fierce, where the Ammonites' best warriors are, and then once they're in the thick of battle, I want you to pull back all reinforcements from them. So it looks like he died naturally in battle. And so Joab does that. He follows the king's orders. Uriah and a bunch of other men die in that battle. The report comes back to David. David gives the report to Bathsheba. She goes into a time of mourning, and then he calls her into his harem, and uh, she becomes his wife, gives birth to a son. Joab, feeling sick for what he has done, there's a section in Samuel where David says, Joab, do not fear. We didn't do this. He was struck down by the sword of the Ammonite. The first part of sin is it will deceive you. It will deceive you. And what we're going to look at this morning is the four steps to understanding true repentance. And they're simple. You've got to see your need for repentance. You've got to confess that what you did was wrong and that you acted on it, that you own it. You have to mourn the fact that you did it. This one's difficult for our culture. But you actually have to mourn the action. This is different from self-pity. This is different from self-hatred or self-loathing. We'll talk about that. And then lastly, you have to come to hate the sin. Not yourself. You have to come to hate sin. Okay? Let's talk about this. I want to put before you something, and I've talked a lot on the theological argument that if there is no God, there is no universal truth, and we can do whatever we want, and we're our own gods and our own truth. So I don't want to go deep into that. I just want, I do want to say this, though. Nobody really goes out. I shouldn't say nobody. On the majority, people do not go out and say, I want to go do wicked things to other people. They're sure there are some who will do that. But if we look at even some of the greatest tragedies of our time, if we look at some of the biggest genocides of our time, those were not men who said, I want to go do something wicked. No, in fact, they thought they were doing something righteous. Did they not? Even the men who crucified Jesus thought they were doing something righteous. Hitler thought he was doing something righteous. Mussolini, something righteous. The current Islamic people who are murdering others by the tens of thousands believe they are doing something righteous. Even when they murder innocent women and children, they are doing it in the name of Allah. So we as people do not enter into sin initially looking at it and saying, here I am about to do something wicked. No, we have justified to ourselves the rationale and the reasoning behind it. And even if we believe it goes against our moral code or our culture's moral code or our religious moral code, 
we still have justified why we did it. Why did you get on the internet and look at those sites? Well, you don't understand how much stress I've been under and me and the wife have been at odds with one another and you don't get it, you don't get it, you don't understand. I just broke, I just snapped. We've justified the sin. Same thing with an affair. Why did you steal from your work? Why did you lie? Well, you, you don't get it, I had to lie. You know, there was a guard interviewed who was part of the gas chambers during the Holocaust. And they asked him, did you want to gas those people? And he said, no. I hated it, but I had to. Otherwise, I would have been thrown in there with them. No, you didn't. You just valued your life more than the thousands that you were destroying. You valued your own skin over truth. So you sacrificed truth that what you were doing was wrong in order to save yourself. You see, there really is no situation where we can sin and actually walk away from it justified. I remember when I was first taught this um, in a class in college. And I thought, that can't be true. There are times when lives save other people and And you have to lie and you have to protect and you have to cheat sometimes in order to save for the greater good. The the means, the end justifies the means, right? You've heard that? David's saying it doesn't. God says it doesn't. Look at verse 1. Remember, this comes from James 2, that our faith without works is dead. I hope I've made this clear, but I'm I'm going to make it clear to you here today. Faith without works is dead does not say that we have to do works to attain anything. The works have been done. Christ on the cross alone has been done. That is our redemption. That is our repent. That is our who we go to for repentance. Sin has been taken care of. But the work of repenting, that's work. That's work. I'm going to show you how much work it is to see, confess, mourn, and hate here in a second. But that's work. That's the work that James is talking about here. The work that David did, but we have an advantage that David didn't. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, would you blot out my transgression? You see, David first here is going to see that he now has a need, and he recognizes, O goodness, what have I done? Now, did David just recognize this on his own because he's such a wonderful guy and it's through his line anyway that Jesus came? No. There was a wonderful man, quite possibly the most amazing man in all the scripture, next to Jesus. His name was Nathan. (laughs) I can't wait to get where I'm going with this. The prophet Nathan comes to David And he's going to give quite possibly the most compelling sermon in all of history. He's going to say, David, can I tell you about something that's going on in your land? And David says, yes, please. He said, there is a wealthy man and he has thousands of flocks. And then there is a poor man and he doesn't have any flocks. In fact, he just has one little lamb. And he loves the lamb like his daughter. He eats with it. It lays in his arm when he sleeps at night. He cherishes this little lamb. Well, the rich man came to the poor man, took his lamb, slew it, and then served it to his dinner guests. Second Samuel says David rises up and says, Who is this? How dare he do this in my kingdom? Bring him before me. And Nathan says, You are the man for what you have done to Uriah. Nathan thought no one knew. He thought he'd gotten away with it. He thought he'd covered all of his tracks. Uriah died in battle. I took Bathsheba as my wife. Now we're having a child together. Everything looks okay. I consoled Joab. He knows that he died at the hands of the Ammonite. Lots of people die in battle. Everything's okay. And here comes Nathan the prophet. David, the Lord sees what you've done. You have taken the little lamb from someone who had nothing, and you killed it. It says, David weeps and mourns. 
he recognizes his sin. And for the first time, he sees it as sin. See, before this, he had justified his means for it. I'm king. I'm under immense amount of stress. She shouldn't have been bathing there anyway. Isn't it her fault? All the ways we justify the lies in our life. And he had been justifying it up until this point. When Nathan comes to him and says, you're the man. You did this. And David weeps and mourns. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And then what he's going to say here in verse 4 is the very key. It is the cornerstone to everything else I'm going to speak on. Because if you can't do verse 4, if you can't recognize this concept and understanding, you can't do anything else when it comes to repentance. You ready for it? Verse 4. Against you and you alone have I sinned. And I have done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Against you and you alone have I sinned. Now wait a minute, what about Uriah? He kind of sinned against him. I mean, the guy was righteous. He was out there fighting his battle before him and he just took him out. How is he not someone he sinned against too? Doesn't it feel, fear, feel unfair? Understand repentance. Understand the heart of repentance is this. Against you and you alone have I sinned, O God. Because it's not against my own concept of right and wrong that I sinned. It's not against my parents' concept. It's not against my pastor's concept of what is right or wrong. It's not against my spouse's concept. It is solely against him that I have sinned. You see, before David committed the physical act of adultery, before David committed Joab to carry out something to murder his friend, he had first committed the error in his heart. He had first committed the adultery in his heart. He had first turned away from the joy of the Lord. Now, what I didn't read and what I, what I encourage you to read on this Father's Day is 11 through 19, the rest of Psalm 51, because it is a song. 11 through 19 is a joyous, triumphal song to the Lord. And you say, how? How in the world could you do something like that, destroy so many lives, still be called a man after God's own heart, and actually be able to sing? Because he repented. He repented. But wait, when I repent, I often feel worse for a while. I feel guilty. I think about it constantly. It keeps coming back to me. It eats at me, the shame. Then you didn't repent. No, this is hard. This is hard truth, and I get that. Trust me, I'm, in, I'm going through it myself. You didn't repent. Because when you repent, you do not repent of sinning against yourself. You do not repent to rid yourself of the guilt or of the consequences that are to follow. You repent because you have sinned against the statutes and the truth of God Almighty. That your creator has laid out from the foundations of the earth his truths. That he has made them known to his creation. And when you repent, you repent against breaking those laws. This is huge. This is huge. Against you and you alone have I sinned, Lord. The reason most Christians don't truly know how to repent, the reason most Christians say, I've been a Christian for 10 years, 15 years, 2 years, and I still struggle with the same sin, I still struggle with not being able to forgive somebody in my life, is because you've never actually repented. You've said sorry. You've asked for forgiveness. You've asked for him to take something supernaturally from you so you don't have to suffer with it anymore, but you've never actually seen your sin, owned it 100% as your fault, and then confessed it before the Lord. And then the mourning part, say, Lord, whatever comes my way, I accept. If I am thrown into the chambers with those we are gassing, then I accept it. I repent for what I have done. 
If I lose my job because it comes out that I've been stealing, then I accept it. Because I would rather be in the repentance and the favor of the Lord than in the lie and the favor of man. I accept it. See, after Nathan reveals this to David and reveals it and he sees it, the scales fall away from his eyes, the Bible tells us he goes and he mourns. He mourns his sin. Not because he was caught, not because of what may come, but because he realizes, as he says here, against you alone have I sinned. Oh God, whatever my sentence is, I deserve it. Whatever you choose to bring to me, I deserve it. Friends, this is true repentance. This is not Old Testament repentance. This is modern day. You want to see change in your life. You want to see miracles. You want to see the mighty hand of God move in your life. There needs to be repentance. Look at 6, 5, 5. I was born guilty. I was a sinner when my mother conceived me. And you desire truth in my inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart, in my inner heart. Purge me of all of this, Father, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Listen to 8. Would you let me hear joy and gladness? Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. When we are in sin, when we choose to stay in sin and believe a lie about why we're in it, we no longer can hear the joy and gladness of the Lord. You can't hear it. You can't hear it in a song. You can't hear it in a message. It blots it out. It puts it on mute. And as David repents before the Lord, I love this, he writes down, I can hear the joy and gladness again. In fact, it is the joy and the gladness of the Lord which brings him back to life. It's what brings David back to the top. But when we live in a false sort of repentance, a false sort of I'm sorry, the joy and the gladness of the Lord is withdrawn from us. They can't coincide together. You can't live in a sin and a false sense of forgiveness and a false sense of actually choosing to change and in the joy of the Lord. They're separate. Let that sink in for a minute. If you've been struggling to hear from the Lord, if you've been struggling to feel his joy, I don't care what circumstances are going on. Come before him and say, Lord, where is my heart? Why do you feel so distant from me? I believe messages like this aren't preached in the church because messages like this cause people to get up and say, I need something easier than that. (laughs) That sounds miserable. Lose my job? What if I lose my wife? What if my kids never love me again? What What if my friends disown me and never talk to me again? Do you think David had some of those concerns? How did it go for David after this? Have you read? Have you read? How does it go for David after this? Well, we could take a look at his son Absalom and Adinijah, those two guys. <laughs> Whew. Just right now, hug your children, be thankful for them because they're not Absalom and Adinijah. Things go rough. His family falls apart. Jealousy, bitterness, deceit, incest. It gets bad for David. But David never leaves the place of acknowledging and saying, Lord, I caused this. It grieves David's heart when he hears the things that his sons are doing. And the child that he has with Bathsheba, it's sick. And God says, I'm going to take it. And so David gets on his knees and he weeps and he covers himself in ashes and sackcloth and he mourns. And when the servants finally come to him and they're scared to tell him that the baby's dead, he gets up, washes himself off and goes and praises the Lord. And they say, why? Why did you mourn before the child was dead and then praise afterward? He said, because I hoped I could intercede on his behalf, but the Lord has sought to judge in this way and it is right, so I will praise him. True repentance. It hurts like AG double hockey sticks. What has happened to me? But I own it. 
I own it. And I will not curse the Lord because of it. I will praise him because he is good. Because he is good. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a right spirit within me. Now here's where we get to the fourth one. He saw his sin. He confessed his sin. He mourned his sin. He accepted the consequences of his sin. He mourned it. And the last one. Lord, change my heart towards the sin. Renew a right spirit within me. I want to see and hate sin the way you do. Friends, the problem with where we live and how we look at sin is that we flirt with it like it's the pretty person in the class, but we know we're not supposed to, but we'd like to get close, but we can't. And so as Christians, we think, I'm not allowed to do that. And we see others doing it, and they appear to be happy with it. And so we like to flirt with sin as if sin is beautiful, and we're just not allowed to touch it because we're Christians. Does that sound familiar? If it doesn't, just go find any secular view of Christianity. That's exactly how they'll say it. David says, no, renew a right heart. Create a new heart in me. Help me to see the disgusting, vile, putrid mass that was my sin for what it is. How it separated me from your love. How it destroyed a man's life. How it ruined my own family. The Bible doesn't go into the guilt that Joab must have had as he sent one of his own men into army and then left him. We don't get to see that. We don't have a book of Joab to hear about what that was like for him. But when you sin, there are countless dozens of people affected by it. And when you continue to cover it up and hide it, it only makes their part of it worse. But when you come clean, when you repent... It sets them free to let it go. Did you know that? When you repent, when you own it, when you say, I want to see it as you see it, Lord, they now can be set free. You can say, Lord, would you take those affected by my sin and would you begin to work in their lives? Begin to let them see what you've done in me. That they may not have to hang on to the cancer that is this, that is my sin. Friends, the world says that we need Superman to come down and save us. And the Bible says, no, Superman became Clark Kent to come down and save you. Right? The world says it's on the mountaintop that you see Jesus. The Bible says, no, it's in the darkest valleys that you will experience a grace you've never experienced before. The cross. You see, we have the advantage, and i got to close here. We have the advantage of the cross, something David did not have. To be able to understand what it means to have all of our sins wiped away. To be able to understand what it means to walk hand in hand with God and his spirit speaking to us. And we ignore it. I ignore it. Sin is standing at your door and it's knocking. Requesting to be let in, promising a life of fun and frivolity and joy. And I promise you this morning, I promise you, that if you were to embrace repentance this morning, embrace whatever comes with it, you will see a change in your life today. It will start today. It's that real. It's that real. Let's pray. Father, I don't want to belabor the point, but God, forgive me. Help me to see areas that I flirt with sin, that I don't take it seriously. God, your church needs repentance. 
believe in one hand we've made a mockery of what it means to give our lives to you. That it's a children's prayer said in a classroom, said in private so that no one can see and then we just go about and we hope for some sort of spiritual transformation. God, help us overcome that disgusting lie. That to believe in Jesus is to turn and to repent. As he said to the woman, go and sin no more. To see sin for what it is, Lord. The destroyer, the ruiner of lives, relationships, joy. And what separates me most from you, God forgive me. I encourage you this morning, wherever you're at, whatever's going on in your head especially if you're a dad here this morning and you've got guilt or you've got shame either put on you by your parents or what you've done to your kids, I encourage you to just come forward. Bow down at this altar, spread out, bow down at your chair and say, God, I repent. I see my sin, I own my sin. My sin is nobody else's fault. There is no occasion that caused me to sin that I no longer put it on. It is mine and I own it. And Lord, I give it to you. I give it to you as yours. If that's you here, I encourage you in just a moment. We're going to have people come forward to take communion and then we have communion in the back. You just make your way forward to this altar and you spend some time with the Lord. We've got bacon and we've got Mentos and we've got men's retreat, but there's truly no greater gift we could give you on this Sunday than to begin to give you the steps to set you free from the trappings of sin and guilt. Amen. So I don't care if you're new here. I don't care if you've never come forward. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 30 years and you know 50 people in this room. If God's speaking to you today, you get up and you come forward. And then we're going to take the Lord's Supper. So I invite our ushers forward. And I also invite you to do this. If the Lord's speaking to you right now, if he's tagging on your heart saying, what about this? You haven't given this to me. You haven't let this go yet. Don't come and take communion, please. God's going to say, that's not what I meant. (laughs) You need to be on your knees, not taking communion. But not everyone is here. Some have felt the sting of repentance. Some have felt the pain of mourning and loss when it comes to truly repenting. And you have come out the other side victorious like David did. You know who David's next son with Bathsheba was? Solomon. Solomon. You heard of him? Wrote Proverbs. Said to be the wisest man who ever lived. Incredible blessing and joy. You want to know what it says in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew? You want to know what it says when it talks about who Solomon's parents were? It says, David and Bathsheba, and in parentheses, the wife of Uriah. You see, your sin may have consequences that will last for a long time, but there is no plan B with the Lord. There is only plan A. And he will weave your decisions into plan A. And so I'm telling you that you can't ruin anything so far beyond repair with the Lord when you come to repentance. So don't allow that liar fear to speak you this morning and lie to you. Our Christ gave his life on the cross. And when he took the bread and broke it with his disciples, he said, this is my body broken for you. And when they had eaten, he took of the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for this exact thing, for the repentance of sin. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, we pray you would bless this communion, the bread and the juice. As we come forward and partake of it, would you, Holy Spirit, be with those who are at the altar, those who choose to kneel at their seat. Father God, would there be real healing here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Three stations up front, three in the back, and we'll close and worship together here.